October 13th. For those of you who may one day find my journal, clutch safely in my back once my bones are one with the vines. I would let you know that mine was not a disease of self-affliction, but rather one of humanity. My sickness, that of every human that has ever walked this wild and forbidden place, I had wanted to know the very reasons for the universe, so, as foolishly as any man might stumble, I found the library. And I believed in those times that no story could tell the edges of the world, that not even the god's eyes shone on it. But then I cleaned off my desk at the end of a semester, and a card made of old, yellowed fiber fell from the stack of papers. The writing on it was ancient, and seemed written in a dead language from a man possessed, but I showed it to my closest friends, and together... We split the atom of sanity and were burned in its light. And standing in that place, I asked for answers. I asked for the death of my mind when all was disproven, and I received it from a creature that made belief itself irrational. A book, bound in damaged leather, tied with cord, the one which, as of now, is locked in a metal chest in my cabin's closet. I fear this book falling into the hands of anyone else. Those who have read it have all gone on to places where the maps are the same at any angle. And as I fear, I may now have been ensnared as they were. The book was written in English, yet no man could have written it. I spent days feverishly reading it. The darkness and light burned me away until I was a part of it crushed into singularity with the universe. It spoke of primordial gods created from the chaos of the universe, how they'd crashed into the natural earth to form the entity that would create mankind, a convoluted machinica of progress and decay, while the deep, cool earth slept, and gathered the knowledge lost by mankind. It spoke to me of the trees, of the sun, of revelry and verdant praise, of light and power, of a quiet love from afar for all mankind. It spoke of the universe, and the universe beyond, and beyond that, the hinterland had captured me. It captured me, and it pulled me here, and here I now stand, and I'm unable to find a way back to the point I started, so I find my knowledge of the world is now smoke. October 14th. If one finds themselves lost in a forest, or finds themselves free from direction, the best advice would be to wait and let someone find you before you wander even further. But not only do I believe that is now pointless, I feel as though can't, that waiting would cause the world to pull out from under me and I may fall into a formless abyss. I have chosen to walk the path, chance the universe, roll its dice with my footsteps. Considering I have been entrapped by the same gods that have already gotten the others, I, I think there is little use in thrashing, save to make the venom take me faster. October 15th. As a child, I once wandered the area around my home, looking in awe as the world changed with time, and I changed along with it. Leaves turned. The air grew cold and still. As I grew taller than did the surrounding trees, I'd often wonder if mankind formed as the earth cooled from its initial form of hellfire and hydrogen gas. Were we made by gods, or... As the forest told me, did we rise from dirt and moss, eyes made of fresh spring water and souls made of wood and branches that long to stretch to the sky? Vines grow and overtake, and things fall to ruin, as do we as humans. Some ruin from disease, some from poison, some are cut down before their fingertips can touch the sky and know the air. In a way, these trees near immortal shrines to nothing, 
have surpassed us in every way. And they have more meaning than we do, a quiet purpose. And they seem to radiate emotions that have no names. But then again, names are things made by man in an attempt to understand the worlds they lock themselves into. October 16th. I keep believing it was supposed to have snowed last night. I remember in my cabin hearing from the ranger station that a snowstorm was coming from the north, coming down from Washington with a fury, and that's why I had entered the forest in the first place, to gather high knot for the fire. Though, I only have a bottle of water, there has been no complaint from my body, no hunger. I, I didn't notice it at first. I've never been one for indulgence, but this seems almost unnatural. I have no real desire to think on it. I choose simply to take this divine energy and keep walking. October 17th. When I was 14, I had become an untamed, monstrous thing, quick of wit and sinister in design. My father's drunkenness had come to be a disease that would surely end him, and he infected me with his anger by brutal contact. The childish dreams of the forest had abandoned me then. Maybe I just stopped hearing its call. I was, after all, just a boy in the dangerous 70s when war was all we feared, which I believe also poisoned me. And perhaps the forest was a mark of my innocent adolescence, something to eventually be discarded. The Vietnam War took many things from all of us back then. For some it took parents, for some, it took much more. Some fathers came back from the war marbled and wrong. They tried to fill themselves with alcohol in desperation to remember the person they used to be. Unlike other gods, those of war do not care what they take as means to their ends. Some of their blessed came back with a thirst for fermented grain and eventually turned to a ravenous hunger for lead. Gods of war do not care for those youths they leave in their wake. October 18th. I believe I am right. I believe I have walked east. The forest has gone from autumn to winter, and I feel almost renewed, as if the ancient, nameless gods of this forest have given me strength. I watch the sun begin to set, and I find my place in a warm bed of pine and hemlock branches. Some time walking today I had forgotten about my search for civilization. Did I even have a purpose in my cabin with my books and candles, with my writing, the diaries? I feel as if it's all so deliberate, almost artificial. And I begin to wonder if this forest is beginning to try and take me to make me into a tree to grow into the sky I once dreamed of, to bask in the sun and sleep in the cold, and would that be so terrible? Would that be the end of me, or the reward for having braved the trials of life? Did the ancient Greeks understand the words spoken to them by the gods? Could they hear the gods' words and the crashing of the waves on the sandy shore, or the crackle of a fire, or the clap of thunder? What power did they have to hear their words, and what would those gods say now? The wind blows through the trees as dark falls, and I, I think I can hear them. The gods are whispering to me in words so ancient that humans cannot speak them, words humans have lost the meaning of. An inexplicable, far-off fear sets into me as I look around at those nameless monuments. Is it the ancient gods of dirt and root walking around me? And what do they wish to communicate? October 19th. Mist had rolled in during the night, overtaking everything in a mind-warping sea of fog. And against my better judgment, I tried to walk onward, but I fell and rolled down a slope, bending myself like a nail on the side of a tree that grew resiliently on this treacherous slope. I've laid here 
in the bottom as I tried to recover myself. And it's now noon. This is, I believe, the seventh day I have been walking in these wilds, and against all reason, I have survived. The gods of this primordial earth have taken a liking to me, I think. And perhaps I did something they liked. Perhaps this is the afterlife, or the way to it. I wonder, then, how I might have died, perhaps frozen on that first night. I mean, I'm sure I had been alive on the first day. Though this would normally terrify any man, I feel a slight comfort from it. And I have looked to these trails and darkness and found happiness, contentment, wonder, emotions man has no name for nor explanation. October 20th. As a young man, I strode through the bleak existence of manhood, living as humans do in a world with no sun, shivering under the coldness of that confinement and wishing for, for my life to end. Having no family meant nothing to hold me down, and I spent my childhood going between homes, through the muddy paths of chemical obsession and sleeping under rainy skies, I became tempered against the hardness and harshness of the world. Having no love made me immune to the knife of a rogue and the hunger of loneliness. I had been stripped to nothing. It was one night when the sirens were closing in on me and I was fleeing certain imprisonment that I came upon a cliff and a solitary trail, and I fled there, climbing higher and higher, escaping the fog of the combustion engines and the chemicals that held my brain prisoner. I found a cave on the cliff, once a line through which goods were moved by rail before the interstates and highways became commonplace, and I, I sheltered here as a storm came down. My pursuers gave up when I couldn't be found, and here I came down with a sickness unlike any other I've ever experienced. In sickness, I lay against the wall of the cave, my mind spinning until it came to rest and I saw the sun, and I felt warm earth beneath my body, and the sun dappled down from the boughs of trees, and I achieved a, a sort of awareness brought on in the escape from my self-inflicted disease. And half mad, half dead, I crawled out of the cave. I was desperate to see something I did not understand, and I crawled on rocky soil and tore my body to pieces to reach the top of the cliff, and when I did the sky opened up, and, and I was stripped from my body by what I saw. A great flash of light, and the heavens spiraled out before me in the night, limitless and bright. And I became a man again, more than a man, under earth and sky. And the chemical addiction was torn out of my brain like a parasite. I was filled with stars and planets, and I was made whole again by the universe. And after this, I found myself with new clarity and purpose, though I hadn't had purpose before. And after this, I found myself with new clarity and purpose. I was certain that the path forward was before me, and I took it. October 21st. The path is now gone, lost to vine and root and shroom and rot, and I have simply trekked the strange trail that seems to jump out at me from between the trees, but I am now lost in an ancient valley that shows no sign of ever having known human life. It is pure and untouched in the way that you can look up and be confused for lack of a sky beyond the boughs. It's dark here, but I am ever hopeful. I have found plenty to drink to the will 
of the ancient gods that watch me. Hope is a strange thing in this forest, for one would be where I am and curl up and give up, but I have chosen to look up into the sun. I have chosen to look to the path ahead and see something more waiting. To walk this path is to leave the past behind. To keep walking the path of life, one must learn to leave memories in the pages before them, to leave the pain in those pages. We do not carry those pages with us in our heart where they cover the sun above. You can go back and read, learn from the pages of your past, but never carry them in your hands. Leave your hands free to write a better path ahead. But sometimes, when you live in a world with no light, as I have, you have to climb and break the fog to see the sky again. October 22nd. This valley seems to stretch on forever in a great maw that appears to be open to anything that might fall in. I have tried to find my way back out of it, but the walls have come in on me, and the top of the gorge I have tumbled into seems fenced with trees. As the sun rose to its high peak, I have found what I believe is the end of this veritable ravine, but it has come to a cave that I am loath to enter. No matter what the gods may say to me, I will sit for the rest of the day and rest. Hopefully the trees will speak to me in answer. At noon, I decided to make a descension into the roots and unknown, into a grave, into freedom, into heaven or hell. As much as I loathe to lose the sky, this is the only way forward. Like life, sometimes the only way forward is through the deep. I have descended into the mouth of a god and found myself among its truest meaning. The darkness has served to strip me of my humanity and create a soul out of me. A ghost of what I once was. A ghost of light, trees, dirt, moss, a black figure, a shadow, a truth in the midst of of the lie of reality. I've become Dante, chosen to plunge into the deepest bowels of the earth, my flashlight, my dearest Virgil, to take me to hell and back out again. Learned of a man's purpose and its inherent disease given to it as soon as it first looked to the sun. Mankind is an entity unique in itself born with the ability to sense and feel, to receive answers from the universe and to perceive with their mind, but through a quirk in our culture, we are brought up to reject that ability as useless, as a heresy, as evil. As a child, I heard the storms speak to me in ancient languages too old to understand, and I heard those forgotten names, but I know them now. I know them as if they were a part of me, a part of all existence. All children of man can hear these gods before they are forced to discard them in favor of bread and wine or whatever mankind chooses to use as the tool to shut down the beauty of man, but some still cannot resist that call and they come back. The forest calls them, maybe the lightning streaking across the sky, maybe the roots of mankind itself in that primal glory, but Something calls them back, and they desire nothing more than to bury themselves in the dirt and be reborn again as a child, to hear them clearly say again with the true voices of the universe. And I am standing at what I am certain is the end of everything. All that awaits me is a single chamber with a bottomless well, and I cannot go back. I have tried to sleep, but it seems all in avoidance of the inevitable fact that I have arrived at my end. I can only record my thoughts here, before I make my descent into space and stars, before I take the last steps of this journey and begin a new one. I have considered trying to turn back, but seeing as I have wandered for so long in this cave, there really is no choice. This is my final letter in this book of memory. I will tuck it into my coat and take my silent goodbye with me into hell. I will dine with demons. God knows I deserve it from all that I've done in my life. 
I'm sorry, Isabel. I'm sorry, Richard. I'm sorry most to you, my precious Annalise. We wanted to know what man should never know. We wanted answers to questions we shouldn't even have been able to ask. The university will know me as William Hensley, a professor of literature and a scholar of ancient gods, but I will go down into hell as just a man who made countless mistakes and misjudgments. I only ask that the gods who whispered to me long ago give me some sort of mercy.